So one more physical property that is affected by intermolecular forces is something called vapor pressure. And so imagine you have a system where you have liquid and gas in dynamic equilibrium. So you have this flask and, you, and dynamic equilibrium means that the rate at which the liquid is turning into a gas equals the rate at which the gas is turning into a liquid. So you reach this point where that's kind of happening uh, at the same time, right? And those rates are equal. And we'll talk about um, equilibrium in, in chem two, but for now, this is what's happening. That rate of the forward reaction equals rate of the re reverse reaction. So the rate at which you're going from liquid to, uh, to gas equals the rate at which you're going from a gas to a liquid. So the vapor pressure is the pressure that the gas is exerting onto the liquid phase at that at that point. So basically, the, how much the more gas you have in the gas phase, the greater the vapor pressure is going to be. And so, how does this relate to intermolecular forces? Uh, pretty easy. So if you have more gas in the gas phase, then you're going to have a higher vapor pressure. So how do you get more gas in the gas phase? You have really weak intermolecular forces. So the weaker the intermolecular forces. So weak, oh. so weak intermolecular forces, uh, here we go. <laughs> weak intermolecular forces means you have more gas in the gas phase, more gas. Um, because you don't have a lot of strong forces holding them together in the liquid phase. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the more uh, the more liquid you have. Like it's harder for them to break those forces to go into the gas phase. So the weaker the intermolecular forces, the more gas, and therefore the higher the vapor pressure. Um, so this is the only one. Uh, everything else was like oh, stronger intermolecular forces, more vi higher viscosity. Stronger intermolecular forces, higher boiling point. This is the only one where the weaker the intermolecular forces are, the stronger the vapor pressure. So high vapor pressure happens when you have really weak intermolecular forces, so it's really easy for those gas molecules, the, the molecules to go from the liquid to the gas phase. Um, volatile, so think molecules that do that really easily, so liquids that evaporate readily, those are called volatile chemicals. And uh, we have vapor pressure is going to increase with temperature. So if you increase the temperature, now molecules are going to have more energy. They're going to be able to overcome any of the forces holding them into the liquid phase. And they'll, it's easier for them to evaporate to, or to go from the um, liquid to the gas phase. So when do substances start to boil? Boiling happens, so the boiling point of a liquid happens when the vapor pressure, so the vapor pressure, equals the atmospheric pressure. So if you're boiling a, uh, some water, right, and you have the lid on there, once the vapor pressure in there, so the amount of gas in the gas phase, equals the amount in the atmosphere, uh, in the, equals the atmospheric pressure, uh, then you're going to see that the, the water will start, the liquid will, will start to boil. And the normal boiling point, normal just means all of this is happening at 760 torr, or uh, which again is 1 atm. So can we use this figure uh, next to us too? So reading diagrams is, is really important. Um, so in this figure we have vapor pressure uh, versus temperature, and then they kind of map out for you where the normal boiling points would be, or where 760 torr is, or 1 atm torr is. Um, so basically to figure out what the boiling point would be, the normal boiling point would be for any of these substances, is you would find where is where does the line cross um, the you know 760 torr, and then drop a line down there and figure out like, oh, okay, this guy has a normal boiling point of you know somewhere between 20 and 40. If 30 is there, then it's somewhere between 30 and 40, so about 34. I wouldn't expect you to be able to read that that was 34.6 from this graph. There's not enough not enough lines here. Uh, you do the same thing on this guy, and then uh, and then also on the water, right? So water's right on on the 100 degrees Celsius. Um, what else you can? What are some other things you can tell from this graph? Basically, that uh, about the, the strength of the intermolecular forces. So if you know where the boiling points are, so water has a really high boiling point, so you know that the higher the boiling point, the stronger the intermolecular forces. So you can say water has um, higher, has stronger intermolecular forces than um, the ethyl alcohol, the ethanol, or the diethyl ether. Oh, and then ethylene glycol, we don't even see where, if you were to kind of like follow this curve up and eventually the, the boiling point's not even on there, you would have to, um, have to see the rest of the curve to figure out where that guy boils, but this guy should have pretty strong intermolecular forces since the the boiling point's not even you know not even on this graph. Uh, so what they want us to do here is use the figure to estimate the boiling point of um, diethyl ether 
but not at a, not at not the normal boiling point, not at um, 760 Tor, but at 0.8 ATM. So ATM is not on here, so we're gonna have to convert that first. So the first thing you want to do is convert that. So I have 0 0.8 ATM and at one ATM, 760 Tor. So when I work that out, it looks to be about 610 Tor. So I'm gonna go to like 610, around 600 here. Draw the line over there and then drop it down. And the book said this is about 27. I would give you anything between like 20 and 40. So this one's about 27 degrees Celsius. If you got 27 degrees exactly on the dot there, then wow, you're pretty, pretty cool. Uh, so when you're estimating anything from a graph like this where you don't really have a lot of lines, I'm, I'm really gonna give you anything in, in between there. There's, there's gonna be a wide range of answers. Um, so there's a note here and there's a little piece in the book about pressure cookers. So the way a pressure cooker really works uh, is it um, increases the pressure so that the water gets hotter faster and so it's going to cook your food, uh, your, cook your food faster. Um, also, if you've ever made, uh, if you've ever made like brownies at, um, on top of a mountain, so at like high altitude, uh, there's different cooking directions. So food takes longer to cook at higher elevations because the atmospheric pressure is lower. So. Um, you have to cook it longer. You should really pay attention to those high altitude cooking directions. So suppose you were able to measure vapor pressure um, and temperature at a bunch of, you know, vapor pressure at a bunch of different temperatures. You could make a graph of, if you plotted the natural log of the, the pressure versus one over temperature, um, you get a straight line and your slope looks like this. And that's how you can get your enthalpy of vaporization. So this is this is called the clausius clapeyron equation. Um, you might see this again in like biochem or something. I've seen this a couple couple different different places. It comes up again and again. Uh, but it's a linear equation. And so you get y, yeah, you know, this is basically your y, right? This is y equals mx plus b, where your x is one over temperature, and then your slope is the delta h of vaporization over r. It's a negative slope. So this is one way that you can calculate the um, the delta h. And the constant there that we're using, since delta H is usually in joules or kilojoules, the R that we're going to use to do this is the 8.31455, that one right there, joules per mole Kelvin. So again, this is the same R that we used in chapter 10, just with different units. Instead of liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, we have joules per mole Kelvin. So there's just a, a quick conversion from liter atmospheres to, to joules. And then you get this equation. So this is a linear equation. You might see this in... Um, in lab. I think we're going to use this in lab. You're going to measure the vapor pressure at different temperatures and then from that you'll be able to get the enthalpy of vapor.